So, we so, so, yeah. so friends, uh, you know, the, we are at the 17th week today, the Saturday manufacturing talk. And as you know, that this is getting organized by the uh, Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, uh, so today's speaker is uh, uh, Professor Santosh Devasya. Professor Devasya would be talking about the, uh, you know, the optimal solution for the multi-robot task allocation. So you know that, uh, you know, the today's era is the automation. And when you talk about the automation in manufacturing, uh, it means that the usage of the robots is essential. So uh, the problem becomes even more, you know, the, the complex when you have multiple robots working together on a problem definition. So uh, how to allocate the task, how to work together uh, without, I mean, avoiding the collision and all. And sometimes the problem becomes even more critical or the complex if one of the robots, you know, the while collaborating, the fails. So, Professor Devasya would be talking about uh, the multitask, you know, the allocation for collaborative robots. And uh, I'm sure that he will be giving us some, you know, the examples in the aerospace sector. Now, let me uh, read the brief bio of uh, Professor Santos Devasya. Professor Santos Devasya received his BTEC from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, in 1988 and MS and PhD degrees in Mechanical Engineering from University of California, Santa Barbara in 1990 and 1993, respectively. He is the Director of the Boeing Advanced Research Center, BARC, at the University of Washington and the Founding Director of the New Advanced Composite Center aimed at robotic manufacturing methods for emerging recyclable thermoplastic composites. He is the Naptesco Professor of Engineering at the University of Washington, Seattle. He joined the faculty of University of Washington Mechanical Engineering Department in 2000 after teaching from 1994 to 2000 in Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. He served as the Associate Chair of Mechanical Engineering Department from 2010 to 2013 and as the Associate Dean of Research and Faculty Affairs in the College of Engineering from 2013 to 2017. He was the General Chair for 2020 American Control Conference and will, will be the Chair for 2023 Advanced Inter Intelligent Mechatronics Conference in Seattle. He is a Fellow of ASME and IEEE. His current research interests include Control of multi agent systems and precision human machine systems, human machine interaction. With this, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Professor Santos Devasya for uh, we are all, you know, eagerly waiting for his wonderful talk. And so, Professor Santos Devasya, please. Well, thank you for the. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you for the very kind inv uh, invitation and for the, and I'm sorry for the wait. I hope I'll make it up by giving a decent talk. So, uh, so this this background picture here is from the University of Washington, from the center of the campus. You see Mount Rainier here on the on the background, and so this fountain and all this is the university university area. And so I want to thank Dr. Paul for the invitation and for organizing these seminars, which is a wonderful way to bring many people together and learn about common problems. So that's ex exceptional, and thank you. I also want to thank IIT Kharagpur for the quality education that I received. You know, so I think, uh, you know, when you're when you're a student, you don't see the big big picture, but as you start teaching, you realize how good that education is. You know, from from the IITs, so it's been exceptional. I'm very grateful for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the talk that I'm giving today is work done by Ben Thurschluck, who was a PhD student. Now he's an engineer at Boeing and he's implementing all the talk, things that I'll talk about. And then uh, the research results are from a couple of papers. So if there are any detailed questions that I'm going to miss, you know, you can always look up the paper uh, in the future. So I thought I'll start with a brief introduction about the Boeing Center. And then I also realized that, you know, the talks are broader on the manufacturing area. So I brought in a couple of other interesting aspects and then we'll talk about the specific problem today and then uh, the results. So just to remind everybody where is Seattle and Washington, you know, there's many Washingtons in the United States. So this is the Washington state, which is on the 
northwest corner of, the, of North America in Washington state. And if you ask uh, somebody, you know, what is Seattle famous for? Uh, I would suggest it's rain and coffee. Okay? The Starbucks coffee is also from here and that's very popular. Um, it also apparently makes Seattle a very romantic city. There was a movie that came out about Seattle and uh, of course, think it's, it's nice, but it's made things more expensive now here. <laughs> so, uh, but rain makes Seattle very scenic. You know, so you saw the Mount Rainier picture from the campus. So this is close up of that. There's a lot of cherry trees. There's a lot of water here. And like, uh, water is very important to our economy in this region. So other things that's famous in Seattle, uh, Boeing started out in Seattle, basically because of the water. You know, there's a hydropower here that enabled cheap power uh, for fa fabrication of aluminum and that created Boeing. Uh, Microsoft is a Seattle company. Starbucks is more popular. Uh, Washington Apples. Uh, UPS started out in Seattle. Costco, which is a wholesale retailer, is also from Seattle. Uh, we have the biggest trucking company uh, is a little bit north of Seattle here. Amazon now, of course, is a big company is launched from Seattle as well. And then there's a new space industry that's popped up, uh, Blue Origin. Uh, and then, of course, the, United, the University of Washington, which was established in 1861. Um, if you come by Seattle, you know, um, you can go visit the Boeing factory. They'll give you tours of the, of the aircraft assembly process. It's a very large factory, and you can walk around the top to look at the big picture view of what's going on. A lot of cruises from Seattle as well to Alaska, Hawaii, and all the other places. So summer is a wonderful time to come visit. Um, and if you have an intention of coming to visit, you know, a good opportunity would be the AIM conference that's going to happen in 2023. Um, so, you know, there's many uh, applications, including robotics, manufacturing, and so on, that goes under this uh, mechatronics conference. So please think about submitting. It's in 2023, July sometime. Um, the Washington University itself uh, was founded in 1861. Uh, we have about 50,000 students. Uh, it has a large medical school. Um, and, you know, we are most proud of the fact we are considered you know, kind of a, you know, very public university in the sense that we have a lot of interactions with industries, we have a lot of patents and things like that. Essentially, it's very entrepreneurial uh, atmosphere. Um, and of course, the cherry blossoms in springtime and summer is just a fantastic place to come visit. Um, but we also leverage our local industry. So we have this big, huge, major industries in, nearby. So what have been, what, and an example of that is this Boeing Advanced Research Center that started in 2014 that I'm directing now. And it essentially provides space for industry. So people from industry will come and sit in the lab, work with students and faculty. So it's a little bit different than the typical industrial funding in the sense that you jointly work on projects. Um, and students are pretty much mentored both by the industry people and the faculty members. Uh, you know, average we run about eight to 10 projects a year, about 15 faculty and about 45 students or so. Um, and the topic areas that we focus on are big data and machine learning, uh, robotics and ergonomics for safety aspects, especially uh, when you're doing manufacturing operations. And there's an emphasis on, uh, on composites, you know, for aircraft, for example. There's always interest in you know, increasing the production rate while maintaining quality and reducing the overall cost. So, uh, and so this Boeing Center led to this, uh, you know, this new center that we're trying to put together on advanced composites. Um, you know, this current efforts, you know, as Dr. Paul may know, if you have a center, there's a lot of things you need to do, like space, money, equipment, people that you need to collect together. And so we're in this process, and we are hoping to launch sometime in the uh, first quarter of next year. And you know, we already have several companies that's been interested in our part of our partnership here. Um, so the question to, you know, one of the questions one always asks is why should university link to industry? You know, um, maybe it's kind of an obvious thing, but uh, from an education point of view, it gives students an opportunity to do applications-based learning. And this is true for all students, you know, from bachelor's to master's and even PhD students. Uh, for example, the talk I'm going to give today is, is by a PhD student who worked on a research problem, which is very industrially applied. And then when students, you know, when they are learning by doing things, when practical methods, they tend to be very highly motivated in these applied problems. Um, and, uh, and the research leads to, I think, really high impact collaborative research. It's, it's, a, it's a source for a rich set of problems with potentially strong impact if we can solve them. Um, and so I thought I'll give you some example challenges in aerospace manufacturing. You know, here's a, here's a, one of the problems that we face. Is, so 
So what's happening here is that, you know, when you make the aircraft wing, it's like a box, you know, and then, uh, so when you put the two skin layers in the bottom and the top skin, it becomes an enclosed box. And then you have the small access holes. So everything that's manufactured inside, cleaning, inspection, is done by people going inside. And that is not a very comfortable atmosphere, especially if you're doing maintenance with, you know, there's oil inside here too. And so there's fumes. And so it's not a, a common, it's like economically challenging. It's difficult for people to go and it's difficult to inspect. And so there are a lot of interesting problems I'm trying to see, can you do something like robotics to help this? And it has been an incredibly challenging problem to make robotics to do confined space manufacturing. You know, typical robots have a lot of sensors, uh, they are heavy, they are strong, they're precise, they are fast, but none of that is applicable inside these kind of spaces where it's low volume production. It's not like a, a car factory where you have lots of cars coming by and each robot does one task. It has to be a lightweight robot, it still has to be precise, it still has to be fast as a human. So if you can meet all of those, then it's viable and that's incredibly difficult to do. Um, and so those, that, that problem has led us to look at a few uh, you know, problems like if you have a flexible robot or something like that, and because the task is not well-defined, you know, the task will keep changing in an aircraft as opposed to like a car manufacturing. You know, how do you teach the robot what to do? Uh, and can you learn from human actions, for example? Uh, then there's also problems with stability. When humans and robots are learning together, you're not sure that they'll remain stable in some manner. And um, you know how do you automate this learning from humans is some of the challenges we face. So uh, just as an example, and I'll give you three, maybe four examples. Here is a, a human is training a robot to do some task. Okay? Um, and so basically the human is in the loop and trying to manage the robot by doing some actions, okay? something like this, you know, you do gestures or actions, and then the robot looks at what you're trying to do. And so you are in the feedback loop. Okay? So this was done, a PhD work done by Rahul. Uh, and so if you look at this control loop here, here's the control system, like a robot, for example, here's a human, and here's what the human is trying to do. Now, if a robot knows what the human is trying to do, the robot is pretty good. They can actually track very precisely in most cases. The problem is that what the human wants to do is not always very clear by the human action. There's a delay between what the human action is and what the human is trying to do. And that can cause problems when you're trying to learn. And so what we were trying to do is to say, okay, can we somehow model the human operator, especially for novice operators, but if an operator is an expert, one time they'll learn how to do this. So for example, there's you know, human beings controlling robots for surgery, but then that, those doctors are expensive and they, they train a lot. And so getting a novice operator to work on a machine becomes challenging. And so the question we're trying to do is, can we help them somehow? And so our basic approach was to model the human being and invert it. And the idea here is that, you know, you're coming up with a model for human operators. And these are not uncommon. People were doing human models for aircraft controls a long time ago in the 60s. And so you try to invert that model and then improve the control system. And we found that, you know, doing that helps improve the precision over time. So here's some examples, you know, if, you, if the human is only doing by, by himself or herself, there's a lot of variation in the tracking of the trajectory over time. Uh, and then when the human and the machine work together, you know, you're able to now control the trajectory better and the machine eventually can, can do quite well. And so this is the tracking error and you can see that you, know, you can see error decrease in these errors. And so we found that having the intention learning helps to improve the learning process. And this is the evolution of the um, error. And there's a couple of articles that, that, that shows this one. The second thing that we were looking at is, you know, when a human and a robot is co-learning, what happens, you know, and there's instability problems. And here, this is work by Jonathan Riavolto, who is now joining as an assistant professor at He built a process system for, for, for the VA hospital here and with the controller that he actually put together. And so one of the challenges we have to these systems is that, you know, essentially you're thinking, you can think about this as you have multiple uh, agents putting inputs. They all have some dynamics and are trying to control the same thing. And we were trying to see, can you show convergence of these things uh, when you have this collaborative collaboration between agents? 
And what we came up with is that there's a, there's a theory that came up that shows that if you partition the task appropriately, uh, and if you can show that each individual agent by itself is stable, then you can ensure that the whole thing will converge. And this is also a couple of articles uh, from Automatica in case you're interested in the details of the convergence. The third thing uh, is work done by Parker, uh, who finished in 2019. Um, so Amazon is a big hire, hires a lot of PhD students, you know, so as soon as the PhD, actually even before they uh, complete the PhD, they often get jobs. And so, um, and so here he was trying to do, you know, this confined space robotic, and I'll show you an example of his work. And so the, the, the application was cleaning up operations, you know, somebody's walking, entering this confined spaces and doing some cleaning operation. The idea was, can you use lightweight robots? to do this kind of cleaning operation. And can those robots learn from human demonstrations? Now, the lightweight robots are, are not very precise and that's the basic challenge you have. You know, they, the precision is not as good. And so you have to somehow learn through that. So here's an action of the human trying to show, demonstrate how to clean a robot. And then the idea is that, you know, that you use machine learning algorithms and dynamic systems approaches to, to mimic that task. And so then the robot is able to mimic that task. And then the advantage of that is, let's say you, you know, there may be positioning errors and so on. So maybe the human demonstrates one task or, you know, guides the, remotely guides the robot to a certain location to do one task. And then once the robot knows its location, it can then take over and do the rest of the task. And so this, this is a project that came out of the Bark Lab. Uh, and our goal basically is trying to increase precision of these, of these kind of flexible robots. And then uh, that led to a, you know, a, an academic type NSF grant and we are working on these projects here. Uh, a third project that, uh, last project that I'll, example I'll give is one by Anish Tiwari, he's also from one of the IITs, uh, which will be graduating soon. And he was looking at network theories, you know, trying to see, if you look at current network theories, they're able to do synchronization at steady state. So it means eventually all the robots will do the same task, but during the transitions, they're not very good. And so, but that's not really helpful if you're doing transportation tasks or flexible objects and so on because then you can get large deformations in the objects. And so here's a video of uh, some of the example works they've done. So here's a robot, and this is an illustrative problem where you're taking a very, very flexible objects and you're trying to do this decentralized uh, transport of these objects. And you can see the first robot knows where the, where, what the desired trajectory is. Maybe it's a human that controls it, but that information, decay, you know, there's a delay in the propagation of the information. And that causes this, uh, deformations in the flexible object. <laughs> so if you're transporting an, a flexible object, this is probably leads to um, damage potentially. So they came up with a new theory and the results are there in the ACC and in archive as well. That enables, you know, you're doing the same uh, maneuver in the same amount of time, but the deformation is substantially reduced by using this new approach that they're developing. Okay. <clears throat> So basically the idea is that you get similar time to do the same task, but the information propagation is better and that leads to better performance. Okay, so I gave you a, a few examples here of different things we are doing. Now I'll, I'll jump to our main topic of today's discussion, which is in a multi-robot scheduling. So this is <coughs> slides by uh, Ben Thershuk, who is now, the, as I mentioned, he was a PhD student here and the clinician is doing a is working now in Boeing, actually implementing these uh, efforts that he did as, uh, did as a PhD student. So obviously having multiple robots is good because it increases production rate, right? Because you have parallelism in the task. Uh, and the other thing that's also important is that, you know, a single robot can do this task too, but you know, if something breaks down, it's this potential for one of the robots to take over the tasks of the other robots. So that's the other advantage of having multiple robots doing something like in a world. Uh, so this is a schematic picture of a, you know, uh, robots drilling in a wing. And this is sort of how they work. You know, they are working in parallel. There are maybe 2000 holes on a wing. This is actually a 115 scale model of an actual system. <clears throat> and so the main challenge that we have here is that we have to minimize the idle time. Um, uh, so essentially all the robots should finish this work ideally at the same time. Why? Because everything is expensive. 
the, the wing itself is extremely expensive. Each robot can be expensive. These are gigantic robots. And so if you're just sitting idle for 15 minutes, that's not considered good at all, right? So if one robot, I mean, if all the robots are finished up and then one robot is waiting for 15 minutes, that's considered bad. And this is over an operation that might take you know, several hours. Of course, the second thing, of course, they don't, you don't want them to collide with each other. That adds constraints to the problems. And then the final thing that makes it really challenging is that as opposed to you know, each robot doing a specific task, in an aircraft assembly operation, the part itself can have variability. So there may be pieces that's not completed and so that'll be completed later. So you have to skip some areas, for example. So the condition of assembly tends to be very different every time. And that makes it really hard. Otherwise you could have optimized one time and then you would have done the same thing every time. And that's not acceptable, and that's not possible in such cases, especially in this low manufacturing channel. And so the main objective here is allocate. I mean, you need to know which robot does what, and then the timing is also important. You know, you're trying to schedule a task such that the overall process time is minimal. So essentially the goal is minimize the time it takes, but you want all the robots to finish at the same time if you can. You don't want to wait for something. At the same time, you cannot wait for 15 minutes to compute either, you know, because some of these solutions can take a long time. And so why is, I mean, how, I mean, if you think about allocation and scheduling, uh, it is a hard problem. <clears throat> you know, uh, these are considered NP hard problems. And this is really intractable for our scales. You know, we have about 2000 holes with four robots that can take hours to optimize, to, to find the minimum one, optimal one. So there are many versions of this, you know, like a hundred tasks uh, for six robots takes one hour. Here's an example with a Monte Carlo based approach. And it's still only 80% optimal. Um, uh, and so that's, this is why when we have about 2000 holes and four robots, it's, is really, really a hard problem. <coughs> and it becomes harder because you can have breakdowns in the, in, in the end effectors, in which case one of the robot goes away. So you have to re-optimize and that makes it even harder because you can't do optimization on the fly for such problems. There are many uh, approaches that people have looked at, but in all of these cases, <coughs> even with about three to 500, um, tasks. First of all, they're not very optimal and they tend to be uh, time consuming essentially. So the scheduling can, uh, is typically, if you, if you take a reasonable computational time of a few minutes, then it's not really optimal. Uh, and that makes it difficult because then you have delay, you know, you have, you have robots that are waiting for this. The other approach is decentralized approaches that people also apply. Decentralized approaches is where, you know, each robot is considered as an individual agent. They are buying and selling, uh, you know, which task they will do. Uh, they tend to be very fast methods, you know, they're called market-based methods, but still they're not optimal. Okay. Uh, and there are several methods that people have looked at in the, in the recent years. And so basically it is, you know, we all know that NP hard problems are difficult to do, you know, addressing them is difficult. There's no free lunch. So if you do very fast methods, they tend to be non-optimal. So you're, you know, you're wasting time and that's difficult. And on the other hand, if you want to increase the optimality, you have to wait for a long time and it's still wasting time computing. So it, this, that's why you, you're stuck in this problem. And what do you do with this? So our challenge here is to do somewhat of a reasonable computation, but we also want an efficient approach. For this, I mean, this is a really practical problem. They actually want to implement this and then how do you do that, right? So. To summarize the problem, you know, you can either have very fast computations, but not optimal. So then the robots are idle because of poor allocation of the schedule. The other, other things that you have is the slow computational methods, which are really optimal, but then you're waiting for the robots to do this computation because, you know, your condition of assembly is different and you're optimizing for that particular condition. And so what you really want is fast computation and high optimality. Okay, that would be ideal if you could get to that. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do is to, and the main contribution of this particular paper is that you have a practical method for, for a practical set of problems where you get near optimal schedules with fast computations. Now, uh, so the fundamental question we address is how, how do you break this NP hardness of this scheduling problem for this setup? Now, as we know, it's not feasible according to literature, but we need a practical solution. So I want, to, I want to emphasize that this is not a general solution to NP hard problems. That's really, you know, that's not something we've done. But what we have done is that for us important class of problems in aerospace, we have a practical solution. Okay. And this is basically exploits the geometry of the problem and then tries to uh, use some um, market-based methods later on. So I'll explain that in a couple of slides. 
Um, there are also other practical issues that one needs to consider, and that was considered in Ben during with his thesis. One is that, you know, where do you keep those robots? You know, sometimes you can also have robots that's moving uh, on a rail, for example. Um, so do you have stationary or do you have them fixed? And if fixed, where do you keep them? So these are important questions. But the second problem that also is important is managing precedence constraints. Um, there are constraints when you're doing manufacturing such as this, where which hole has to be drilled after which one uh, to ensure that the fastening process is good. Um, there can also be, you know, drills that are changing, you know, dimensions of the holes can be different. And so uh, not all the holes, the holes are not all the same. So you need to worry about the time it takes to change the drill and so on. So th these are all practical issues uh, that has been addressed, but I'll talk about the first problem because it's kind of an interesting one. So the type of problems we are going to look at is where you have some sort of an axial direction um, to the thing. Uh, and there are M pairs of robots, you know, there's a top robot, bottom robot, top robot, bottom robot. They're doing this work on this axial kind of structure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then many aircraft structures have this actual structures. For example, a wing structure, the fuselage, which are all amenable to these kind of things where you have pairs of robots working on either side, um, trying to optimize the system. So then the question becomes, you know, how do you define what is efficiency? Right? How, I mean, how do you determine? Because the most efficient thing is kind of hard to compute anyway. Um, so let's assume that each task that you're doing takes some time. Okay, so drilling a hole takes a minute or something like that. And you have a, a number of tasks available that you're trying to do. And so <clears throat> each robot is taking some time to do each of these tasks. And then there may be failures that happen, uh, which you cannot control, right? So a robot might go out of service because the end effector broke or something. And so that's a repair time for fixing the robot. And then of course we have this 2M number of robots here. So if you think about <clears throat> How much time does it take to complete all the tasks, right? Uh, it is a sum of all the times it takes to service all the holes, that means drill all the holes, and then any failures you may have, that is also extra time that you need to spend uh, to repair that. So it's a sum of all these times. And then you have to split that among all the robots, right? So the most optimal time you could have gotten, I mean, the best you could have ever done is sum of all of these task times and sum of all the repair times divided by the number of robots you have. If you could evenly distribute that, that would be the best case. So in some sense, there's a minimum time you'll need to complete this task. And any algorithm that does that is, you know, really ideal. Uh, it's hard to get to that, but if you can do that, that'll be perfect. And then the actual time it takes is the, is the time we'll consider as a, as, is a, is a robot with the, with the most amount of time it takes. So, if some of the robots finish early, it doesn't matter because we're still waiting, right? So we just look at the robot that takes the most time to complete the task, its task and its repair task, right? So we define the efficiency as this minimum time uh, divided by the actual time. So if things are ideal, these both are equal and becomes one. Most of the times the actual time is much larger than the, uh, the minimum time. And so efficiency is less than one. And so our objective here is then to maximize this efficiency. So we, we look at this problem with, with three basic assumptions here. One is that the tasks are uniformly distributed uh, in the sense that you can partition the, the task into M service sections of equal time. Uh, in a ring that is possible to draw these lines where you get partitioning of this uh, task. And then we also assume that the robots are placed evenly across them so that you, know, you can get a middle line or, or, or line in the middle somewhere that partitions the tasks also evenly between the top and bottom robot. So you are assuming some sort of uniformity in the task and the uniformity of spread of the task along this, along this structure. Uh, and then uh, if it's a uniformly distributed set of tasks, you can assume that, you know, the robots will all complete these tasks in an even number of time. Of course, you can adjust these lines if your holes are different dimensions, you know, to the left or the right, to ensure that tasks are equally distributed. So essentially, we have used geometry of the problem and the task distribution to find a partitioning of the space so that each of these robots will take equal amount of time to finish its task. Okay. Um, and so this basically allows, given this partitioning, 
then basically the idea is that you uh, you sequence the robots to go along a pattern. They're all moving to the to the right, for example. Uh, and then you offset the robots initially so that you don't get um, conflicts between robot the robot on the top and the bottom. And once once let's say the robot the bottom robot finishes the task in the shaded area, the top robot will finish the task in the in the shaded area on the top here. Then this switches back to the left, and then these robots will continue. So that's the that's the key. This geometric partitioning is the key to solving this particular set of problems. Um, and and this allows and so now if you can imagine that this distance is sufficiently large, you should be able to ensure conflict-free nominal schedule. This is assuming there's no breakdowns and so on, right? Uh, you'll get a nominal schedule without conflicts. And you know uh, <clears throat> there are some proximity constraints, so you know you have to. Uh, you can say that you want to have a certain factor of safety. You can come up with conditions on what this dimension should be. Uh, but you know, it's basically essentially saying that the spacing should be sufficiently large, and the and the offset should be such that this robot starts for you know returns first before the second robot returns. So therefore, there's no conflict between the top robots. So this is these two things came from geometry. Okay, so that's this is why I'm saying it's not applicable to every problem that's MP hard, but certainly for aircraft manufacturing where you have a lot of long structures such as wings and fuselages with many, many, many manufacturing operations. This is a very reasonable approach. Uh, and uh, we won't belabor this, uh, this math here, basically it's saying the same thing in terms of transitioning. And so this gives us a nominal schedule where all the robots will finish at the same time and there's no conflict between the robots. Okay? All right, so then what happens when you have failures? Because what will happen is, let's say this robot is doing some task and, and its end effector fails or something happens on the end effector, or even you say something unexpected happens, a tool. So then the robot will get out of service and replace the, uh, you know, the, 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 the end effector, for example, and then comes back. So now one could resume that we can re-optimize this whole thing, but that's going to be challenging as we talked about, and it could, be, it could take time. And so what we do here is that we, because we have a nominal schedule that's conflict-free, we just skip the region where, uh, where during its failure. So it was supposed to do all these tasks in the shaded area during this time when it went out of service. So we just return the nominal schedule at the point where it's supposed to have come back. And so you're back to the nominal schedule which is conflict free. So you leave this, this shaded area for a later on work. So that's this notion of leftover. So you may have multiple leftovers where robots will have gone out of service and they will come back. And these are to be completed later on. But the advantage of this is that although you're leaving this leftovers, the scheduling is still uh, conflict-free and all the robots would have finished the remaining work at the same time. Okay. And so these leftovers has to be, has to be completed later on. But the, but the beauty of this problem now is that the leftovers, although there's, there could be several of them, you don't have to schedule them immediately. You can, you know, you can collect them as you go and try to optimize it during this uh, time. And then uh, these, these tasks are not that many. Initially, you may have 2,000 holes, maybe you'll now be left with 50 or 60 holes that you're trying to optimize. So that makes the problem a lot more tractable. And so the scheduling of the leftover, uh, and the key is that you're starting hole with four robots, for example, you'll have maybe 100 holes with four robots at the max, and or, well, depends on the number, the failure, I suppose. Um, and so it makes it a lot more tractable. And so we used uh, a, a market-based approach to reschedule these, uh, these um, leftovers. <clears throat> and again, uh, since the number is much smaller, you can manage that optimization problem easily. The second innovation in this idea is that sometimes it's hard to balance the workload because you know, there may be a lot more leftovers in one robot than the other. So it's very important to have some regions which are overlapping between robots so they can share the work. And so one of the ideas here is that the middle spar, for example, we would leave that to the very end because any robot can, you know, there's many robots can overlap here and can share the task. And this leftover, this leftover with this extra set of uh, intentionally leftover uh, shareable task allows us to balance the workload between the different robots. And so, um, this is the math, but basically here, uh, 
you know, this is the market-based optimization method. This is not new, it's a standard method. Basically, you find the robot with the largest workload for the leftovers, and then you say, okay, maybe you can offload one of the work to somebody else. Then you look at the robots that can take on potential tasks and select a task that will minimize the spread in workload, and you iterate this method. This is an iterative method. It takes time, but it's reasonably fast. But since your number of leftovers is not so much, the, the loss in you know, optimization is a few minutes, so it's not so bad. And so here's for ex an example where you can see the leftovers of the, uh, and these are the different colors indicate different robot tasks. And you can see here that the purple one has more tasks than anybody else. And, the, and so you can see the leftover scheduling isn't that complex. It just uh, reallocates some sections to some other robots. Um, so then we took an example to, to evaluate this method. You know, we you know, took a ring with about 2,000 holes. Um, here are the ribs, spars, and uh, the overlap region that we said about leftovers is this middle spar region. Um, we considered you know, five different typical con you know, condition of uh, assembly variations. Um, they tend to be increasingly less symmetric is the basic idea, so at the, where there may be Leftover regions here, or here's a second example um, where, where you have things which are not to be done. And then we considered failure cases for the for the robot and effectors, and these were generated randomly with the probability distribution here. Uh, and then here's an example result. Um, it's so go back here. <laughs> so basic idea here is that you know these are uh, our method here with optimization that we do, and that you know, if you do is the greedy algorithms, these are not very good, tends to be about 80% or so, but they're obviously fast. Uh, but the key point I want to uh, emphasize here is that with the proposed method, you tend to get about 98% efficiency, which is pretty good for these systems. And the computational time is in the in the in the seconds, you know, uh, seconds to milliseconds for these methods, which is also considered reasonable. Uh, and here's a video of, uh, you know, we, we implemented this in a simulation example, then we're not drilling holes here because this uh, prototype is, exam is expensive here, but we are just illustrating the problem that we addressed um, to demonstrate that we can actually implement this. So here's a robot is skipping some tasks here, shown then hello. <coughs> And then you have this leftover works, which gets rescheduled, and the, this big line in the middle where where, where uh, things are, you know, left for the leftover part. And if you optimize the method, then you, you don't have so much leftovers, and the robots tend to get uh, finished in this in, a, in an even amount of time. Okay. So, let's see. I know I, I I was a little bit late, so hopefully I didn't take too much time. All right, so let me conclude my uh, talk with a couple of you know thoughts here. So I think public-private partnerships are very helpful. You know, with government, industry, and academia partnerships, this can be very helpful to increase impact of research. I know you have other speakers who may be talking to this point here. Um, we found that to be very valuable, um, especially for example in the Boeing Center as well as the Advanced Composite Center that we're putting together. It wouldn't have happened without this collaboration. I also find that close interactions with industry can lead to interesting and actually really challenging research problems. Uh, it isn't that the problems aren't interesting or challenging to do, it's just it's so difficult to do that you can't address the real problems. You know, there are a lot of variability that happens in industrial problems that you need to address to make your academic solutions practical. Um, today, for the talk, I gave an example of a specific research question, you know, this NP hardness problem. Which, which is a tough problem. They've been working on that for a long time. The reason we were successful, I would say, is because of the collaboration with, uh, uh, with the industry. So we have a Boeing engineer, Sam Pedigo, uh, as part of the papers as well. He worked on these problems, you know, and worked in Boeing for about 30, 40 years on robotics problems. And he would meet weekly with our students. And it is that, and faculty members, and it is that joint collaboration that makes a, I would call practical theory, where you still need theoretical results, but it's also practical at the same time, so that it can be implemented. And then, of course, transitioning that student into the industry also makes ensures that that actual methods will be actually get implemented in the industry in the future. 
And so from a contribution point of view for this particular thing uh, for uh, Ben's thesis was that, you know, he came up with a partitioning based method to generate a uh, basically exploiting the geometry to come up with a nominal schedule, which was conflict free. And you stick to the nominal schedule for the larger problem, and then you have leftovers, which are much smaller in number, number which can be optimized using, uh, you know, any of the standard scheduling methods, uh, which are tractable because it's smaller number of uh, tasks that you need to manage. And then this method is not a general purpose and a solution to the NP hard problem death by, by any means, but for the aerospace application, this is very valuable. So thank you all for your time. Questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's a wonderful talk. And uh, you know, before I approach to my you know the audience, uh, you mentioned you have nicely mentioned about the uh, the you know the today's this uh, requirement for the today's research is the public private partnership. This ecosystem is very much required, and uh, uh, you know the industry's presence is a must. Now I have got some you know the one technical question that is on the scheduling. So when uh -huh. you talk, yeah, when you talk about this, uh, you know, the multitasking, you know, the multi uh, the, you know, the operation, how do you judge the whether the failure has taken place? Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Paul, could you repeat that question, the last sentence? Yeah, so, I mean, how how does the judgment is made uh, whether the failure has taken place and the rescheduling of the operation is you know, the required? What sort of failure you are, you know, you have given an example of the, you know, the drilling operation by multiple. Oh, no, yeah, failure cases, right, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. You know, robots don't usually fail. The robot itself is pretty sturdy. They, you know, they have long, long run times, but often the drill bit can break, you know, that can happen. And that can cause some trouble. And so that's probably a common problem, I'd say. So, so I mean, in case of, uh, let's say, the failure of the drill during the operation, so does it start from the, you know, the, from the, the point where it, uh, I mean, it has left, uh, you know, the... The drill broke, uh, yeah, that's it. Then it, it is, it's, you know, the robot doesn't do that anymore. Then the human has to go there. It's a, it's a long, tedious operation after that to fix that portion. So that particular spot will have to be done by human. It's a very involved process. It has been documented and a whole bunch of things happens after that. But it'll remain, the rest of the things will get taken care of, yeah. But it's, yeah. But it's just... That's an unexpected uh, event, and so it takes time for for the robot to do something and change that, and so now the things are out of sync, and that was really the problem of you know, real time opti re optimization is really hard to do. So, so I mean, instead of uh, repairing, is it possible to get the uh, failure job done by the remaining robots? Is That's it is, is there any possibility of uh, doing the you know the, the in, in, a, in a, a cognitive approach, like uh, if just some job is not properly done by a particular robot, can that job be, uh, you know, the uh, completed by the, you know, the, oh, yes. the, the robot sitting next? Yes, yes, absolutely. So if there's a long-term problem, you know, whether a robot is having trouble, that's one of the advantages of having a monkey robot system is that then other, other robots can potentially share that task and redo that. So that's a really excellent point. And that's one of the directions that one should go. And one of the motivations for doing multi-robot uh, schedule, multi-robot systems, uh, especially in, in aerospace manufacturing, but yeah, you're right, completely right on that. Yeah. Because uh, that will really help to solve the unforeseen situations a lot. Yes, yes, it, it certainly does. Um, the challenge that we, you know, with all these, with this multi-robot system, with this large machines is that, you know, um, rescheduling is not trivial because, you know, it, once the robot gets out of sync, you may get you know, collisions later. And so usually what happens in practice these days is that when the robots come close to each other, they just stop. And a human being goes there and says, oops, okay, you go to this side and you go to this side. That's not very efficient at all, you know. And so that's why an automation methods are desirable, right? So, but, uh, you, but it definitely helps to have multiple robots and single robots because it's definitely parallel. Again, the, you know, we are talking about aircraft assembly, right? So it isn't a huge volume production as, as an automotive system, but still they're trying to ramp up production rates, you know, to maybe 60 aircraft a month or something like that. That still takes uh, effort, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, and I understand that, uh, you know, the coalition avoidance in case of a failure is really a challenging job, you know, for yes. particular donors. Right, right, right. And, and still keeping optimality, you know, that's the, that's the other challenge. So you can come up with algorithms like, like greedy algorithms, which are very fast in computing, but then if you let the robots wait on the end, that's also not considered pretty good. So. <laughs> Yeah, Professor, there are some questions uh, from the audience, I think, uh, in the chat okay. box. Yeah. Uh, so one uh, question I can read that, uh, what fraction of manufacturing or the assembly at Boeing is done by the robots these days? Oh, that's a tough question. I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, but there are, I mean, a lot of things are done by, by robots, I must say. The large, you know, when you're doing exterior drilling and so on, those are done by large robots. You can, you know, I've, I've been to the factory where you have these gigantic robots that will do their operations. But anything in confined spaces is still done by human beings. You know? So this, this, let me just say this way. There's a huge amount of work that's done by human beings. So if you ever visit the Boeing factory, you'll see a lot of people there, you know, so. And the reason is not, not so much that you can't do automation. It, I mean, you can automate all of these tasks, but it's expensive to automate these tasks because as opposed to one robot doing one thing at a large volume in a car factory, which is very efficient, here each robot has to be able to do multiple tasks, and those tasks could change from one bay of the wing to the next bay. And so having robots is difficult and expensive. It's still automation is still something that people are trying to do, but people tend to be cheaper still uh, in many of these tasks. I'm expecting some questions from my colleagues, faculty colleagues at the IIT Kharagpur, Professor C.S. Kumar and Professor Alokanti Dev, they, they do research a lot in the field of the robotics. Yeah, one question has come. I failed to notice the paper, can you please uh, Sure. Um, the most relevant paper for this particular talk, I've just put that in the chat. That was in the Attribute Robotics and Automation Letters from 2019. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, this is C.S. Kumar here. Uh, Santosh, uh, if I recollect uh, from the this one, he is, I think, 88 batch, but I have 87 batch here. And uh, uh, oh, I, I, I've not been in touch, but it's good to hear the. Uh, I, I, it is good to see this talk, uh, particularly uh, use of robots in the aerospace industry. Having seen, I, I've been to Seattle once and seen the factory there, and uh, you are very right. There quite a lot of uh, humans uh, in the assembly sequence uh, there because Boeing mostly assembles uh, those components which. Uh, they get uh, from various parts of the country right in time and then they get uh, uh, it, it's a lot of human work there and you're right uh, doing uh, robotic work which could be dynamically changing from day to day or point to point is is, is yeah. it's very nice that you could formulate a problem like this uh, which uh, 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 there. So I, I have a, two sets of questions. One is technical related to the problem you mentioned. So you had here mentioned that uh, these uh, are possible um, with a set of robots working together. Uh, the tasks are perhaps uh, nicely, uh, I mean, schedulable. They are not interlinked that much is what I would say that if there are conflicts between the tasks uh, or the sequencing is uh, critical, uh, then if there is a leftover, then uh, I believe uh, the leftover uh, 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 drilling is one thing where you can always, if you miss some holes, you can put them back again later on. But if there is a sequence of activities which are critical, that uh, 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 maybe the algorithm will be a little different. This one thought which came to my mind. Yeah. Yes. Um... Yeah, that's that's a really excellent point, and actually an extremely important point that we that we uh, when when we were talking to the engineers, are one of the things that came up all the time, right? And so there's an article I just uh, put in the chat that talks about the precedence constraints and managing that during the scheduling task. 
But the way to, in a nutshell, and how we do that is we group the tasks which have to be, which have precedence roles as cities. You know, you say these are have to be written together. And then we do the, we, we do the scheduling based on that. So we, we join up the holes that as we, I mean, there are sequences in, in the drilling the hole as well. Uh, you cannot, for example, drill sometime from the middle. There are, you know, points that you need to go to to get uh, coordinates exactly with the robots. So some sensing algorithms that needs to be done. And so one of the approaches we have done in this in this application is that we would group those those tasks together, and that's how we call them as cities. Okay. And then the question becomes: It's like a traveling salesman. So somebody had the question: of What's the connection to TSP? The traveling salesman problem. The basic question is: Which robot goes where? And then, you know, you're trying to go there only once, and then you're trying to find an optimal way to go through them, right? So that's the traveling salesman problem where you have multiple cities, and each traveling each salesman is trying to go to one city, and only one city, and then complete the whole task. And of course, you have multiple sales. So that's the connection. And so basically, by grouping the tasks, we are able to manage some of the precedence constraints. So I hope I answered your question, President. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's the way you can start looking at it, uh, provided that you can group and identify them in some sense. They are uh, the same. So it goes back to scheduling and all that. So that's a nice. Uh, that so there was an interesting problem. But then if you also add in things like you may need additional fixtures to do scheduling or you have to have the fixtures also in place, drilling, accurate drilling will probably need a fixture at some place also at some time. So those uh, will also uh, matter. Yeah. So, yeah. No, you're, you're completely right that this, it is challenging and that's why it's a tough problem to crack. And I think they've been talking about this problem for about four or five years, you know, so finally they came to, you know, with this ban, it was unsuccessful. So they've hired him and they've hired him to implement this actually in the factory. So we are very hopeful about it. You know, so Excellent. We'll Exciting. It's nice to see that you could find a practical use. In, yes. You know, yeah. And that's so, the challenge, finding a balance between practicality and also from an academic point, you want to have a good research problem as well. So that working with industry, Finding that is really, uh, it takes time. It takes time to build that collaboration, trust between each other, to say that it's going to be useful for the company as well, right? So, yeah, that, that's the key thing here. It creates yeah. the academic angle to it as well as solve part of the industry problem. Very yeah, the understanding each other is the, is the challenging thing. So yeah, second, okay. second set of questions. I think it's not technical, but I think I, I recollect you uh, being in touch with Professor. You were working with Professor Samantha, I think, uh, when you were here, no? Yes. Uh, uh, Professor Viswanath yes, yes. Samantha. We, we have kind of lost touch with him. Uh, are you in touch with him by any chance? You'd like to be yes. back to him? Yeah. Yeah, if you send me an email, I'll I'll forward it to him and connect to you with him if you like. Yeah, I, I meet him once in a while. You know, he comes to the conference, so I, I I just meet him. So yeah, he was my advisor for my undergraduate thesis. So. Yes, and the the uh, the measurements and controls lab and a lot of things such as and that. So controls is an activity we would like to keep maintaining in some sense, and if you, if you're I uh, will be happy to be in touch with you to see if there is a way we can uh, sure. keep that activity yeah. going. It's, uh, it's good to see this presentation. So it reminded me of all those things that were happening that time, along with Professor Samantha and all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was very lucky, um, especially Professor Amlinda Mukherjee, you know, he, he taught controls to us. Right. And I, I, that was probably my motivation to go to graduate school. I would say, you know, uh, his 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 class was wonderful, and then yeah. uh, Samantha was really exceptional. You know, he was, you know, he was, he was just graduating, I think, at that time, and so it was wonderful to have him, almost like a colleague. But he was very friendly too. It was kind of nice. You know, so. Yes, he was one of the students of Professor uh, Mukherjee that time. <laughs> yes, very yes. good. Yeah, so Professor Deva says there are some more questions at the chat box. Uh, it's from Mr. Ranjan Dasgupta. If there are task distance constraints, how do control synchronizations can be achieved and maintain the optimal scheduling? Yes, uh, this, I mean, uh, as Professor Kumar also asked, that is one of the important questions, you know, like, um, uh, you cannot drill. So there are some precedence constraints in the, in the holes as well. You know, you may you, before you drill one hole, maybe a sec before a previous hole has to be drilled. 
So the constraints like that, which are very um, proprietary information with all these aerospace companies. And so um, they, those constraints are really hard to manage. So the way we, way we manage those constraints is to, is to say, if typically those go in groups, you know, there are groups of um, uh, holes that have some constraints with them. And so we may make sure that we, we, when we are doing the scheduling, we keep those groups intact. And within the group, there's two options. And so we also exploit that aspect as well. And so the scheduling has to be mindful of that. And it's still possible to partition that. For this particular application, you know, we can still keep those cities and do a reasonable partitioning of the task. And, and so the second paper I, I, I you know, this uh, one in uh, computer integrated manufacturing is handles those uh, practical aspects as well. So maybe you can take a look at that for the details. Uh, there is one more question from Mr. Chan. For robot failure, did you use any distribution to simulate the failure and recovery instance and time? Yeah, so in this particular uh, paper that we talked about, uh, ben did about, you know, about, let me see, it was like five uh, conditions of assembly. So that's just a, st a standard thing. But in addition, he, when he was doing the simulations, he considered about, um, let's see, 200 or so um, failure cases. And this were all uh, done, by, oh, sorry, 100 failure cases in each, each condition of assembly. And this were all randomized with, a, you know, standard deviation and mean based on you know, actual uh, factory values, you know, average values that we can think about. Yeah, yeah. that's really important to simulate that way because otherwise you're optimizing for a specific thing. So you don't need to include the randomness inside that. So that's true. Yeah, one question is there from Mr. Dave. Yeah, any specific is the example of robots being used for manufacturing assembly and going especially for composites? Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, so the new composite center that we are putting together, uh, we are trying to do uh, a robotics-based, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing of composite structures. So this is a gigantic robot, you know, it's about um, uh, with a very large reach. And so using composite tapes and you're winding the tapes and we're doing thermoplastics and thermosets. And so uh, definitely robots are used for assembly of composites, uh, especially large composite structures. And uh, that is a hot topic. So therm there, are, there are thermoset materials, you know, which don't change properties after some time when after you cure them. And those sort of thermoplastics, which are more repairable. And so there are a lot of research questions in how do you do those machine, you know, this uh, automatic assembly. So the wing structures, the composite wing structures that you see in, in, in the new aircraft <laughs> are all done by, uh, by robotic systems, uh, tabling uh, systems. So. Yeah, I, I think this is the last question uh, from Mr. Omkar. Omkar's question is on what is the role of robotics in cognitive management? What is the role of robotics in uh, cognitive management? Yeah. So uh, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by cognitive manufacturing. Is that uh, intelligent manufacturing? What, what, can you explain that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think he wants to uh, mean that the human-like intelligence. Uh, you know. Oh, right. So there is, in, there is interest, I must say, in trying to help the human being manage the manufacturing task. Um, for example, in sanding operations or in, or in confined space applications. Where the number of number of uh, parts you're doing is so small, maybe ten or fifteen, that automation becomes full automation becomes really difficult. So, for example, if you only are sending a few um, interior parts for an app, for example, to fully program a robot and then execute that is is extremely expensive <laughs> because you don't have the volume. And so therefore a human is doing the sanding operations all day you know, and it can cause a lot of injuries. So now we, they are trying to figure out if there's a way to uh, help the human do these operations. Uh, and then so training the robot is also difficult. Uh, and so you're trying to learn from an expert, for example, on how to do some tasks. And so there is a lot of effort on trying to, to do that. 
Now, in the confined space robots, like you know the one that I showed with small robots that you can place inside the wing, those tend to be extremely uh, imprecise. But a human can still operate them and manage them, but they tend to be very slow. So the hope is that if they become somewhat intelligent, they can become as fast and precise as a human, then they can be put into an assembly. There, there are no robots available currently that can operate inside the wing, for example, in an efficient manner. There, there are many, many attempts by many researchers, but it still doesn't work because it's not reliable. They're not as fast as a human being and they're not as precise as a human being. And so that is the challenge. And so we ourselves have been working on that for about four or five years. We're still hopeful, but those are still extremely challenging forms. So if you can learn from humans, if you can become more smarter on doing things, um, you know, humans can do things by just feel, which is extremely difficult to replicate. You know? uh, and so if you go to a factory and see how they assemble something from behind using a mirror, that is really, really hard, you know? and so there, there is there's a lot of scope to learn from that, and there's a lot of interesting problems available to try and solve those. Yeah, I think there is one more question from Mr. Sudip Day. As dealing with such system, uncertainty is unavoidable. So, do you have any plan to integrate the issue of uncertainty in such system? Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, and you know, uh, uncertainty uh, in our in our case, obviously, the major uncertainty comes from failures, right? So the end of the failure is incredibly difficult to predict, uh, and so that causes uncertainty, and you have to deal with it. The actual drill times can also vary a little bit, you know, and so therefore, you know, often that can be um, managed by doing some adjustment of the travel times between holes and so on. But yeah, that is uh, definitely an important issue that needs to be addressed in the practical problems. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. I think we have covered, uh, you know, the, almost all the questions. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Devasel, thank you so much uh, for your nice talk. It's a really an interesting, you know, the problem. And we are really grateful that you have, uh, you know, the accepted our invitation for giving a lecture at this, this Saturday manufacturing talk. Uh, as I mentioned, this talk has, is getting organized by the Center of Excellence in uh, Advanced Manufacturing Technology. And, uh, you know, this center is also an ecosystem where the public, private uh, sector organizations are working with IIT. And we do have also the startups on board. So we are working for them and we are also giving training to the MSME people and also the industry, the large scale industry people on different, you know, the topics in the field of management. Again, thank you so much and thanks audience. Be safe at this, you know, the, the pandemic days. And uh, I request Ananta to, uh, you know, the, let us know what the speakers for the next few weeks. Ananta. Are you there? Yes, sir. Is yes, it visible, sir? It does not come to my screen. Yeah, let me see. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the next week is the July 10th. It will be uh, by Dr. Kundendu Sina from Tata Sons, and his topic will be the Triangle of Tourism of Government, Academy, and Industry. Then, uh, uh, that very interesting talk on additive manufacturing by Professor Amitab Day of uh, IIT Bombay. So these are the two talks, uh, I, you know, the schedule on January 10th and 17th, and then on 24th by Professor Sudeshna Saltar on AI in, in activities of, uh, you know, the manufacturing. Professor Saltar is uh, faculty, senior faculty member of IIT Kharagpur. And then uh, on the last week of July by Professor Paulo Bartolo from University of Manchester on Technical Management. We have covered quite a few lectures on, uh, you know, the, the, in the field of the, the robotics, starting from the, you know, the soft robotics to robotics, multi-robotic system, multi-agent system. And Professor Paulo P3 has given a very, you know, the nice suggestions today that to compile all the, the lectures in the field of the robotics and then come up with some research you know, the statement or the problem statement so that we can work together. So with this, uh, you know, the, I'd like to uh, conclude, uh, you know, today's session and, uh, you know, we hope to see you in the next week.
that is on 8th of July, the same time, 8.30. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.